Lord, I believe that you're going to lead us in the paths that you want us to go. God, I pray for that person that's here today, God, that maybe hasn't ever stepped out in full obedience to follow you. But God, they're here, so they've taken that first step. For one reason or another, they found themselves here sitting in a church service that maybe they never thought they would ever be in. But God, for some reason, they're here. And Lord, I believe that they're here is because you're drawing them. God, I believe that this message specifically today is a message that you wanted them to hear. And Lord, this is their first step to come into a saving faith that's going to be all in in a way that trusts you for everything. Not just their salvation, but also their daily walk with you. God, life's hard sometimes. Most generally it is. We go through different trials and circumstances and crises in our life that Lord, we can't do this on our own. Every time we do, we mess it up. So God, I pray today that each one here today would give you freedom to just move in their life and guide them and convict them and lead them, encourage them. Lord, we just need you. There's not a single person that's in here and and not a single person that was in the other two services, Lord, that don't need you. Lord, we're all in the same boat. We can't make it to heaven without you. So, Father, I pray today that for those that have not collided with you, well, today would be the day, God, that they meet you. And, Lord, that you would impact their life in a way that, Lord, they would begin the process of stepping out daily in steps of faith. And Lord, they would follow you to the ends of the earth, whether it be to Haiti or to Texas or to just across the street to their neighbors to share the good news of Jesus Christ. How you got a hold of their life, picked them up, turned them around and put them on solid ground and gave them a testimony to share. God, I pray that that happens today. What a glorious treat it is to be able to share your news with people. And Lord, I pray today that you would fill me with your Spirit. Give me what I need for one more service to proclaim your Word with passion and boldness. And God, I pray for changed lives. Changed lives in a way that's not just walking out on an emotional goosebump, but Lord, one that's really going to stick, that's really going to change. And Lord, that's nothing man can make up. It's only by the power of the Holy Spirit that we can walk out truly transformed from the inside out. So Lord, lead us step by step to a real faith in You. We love You. It's in Jesus' precious, holy, and amazing name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. You can be seated. So I heard about a couple of brothers that were actually truck drivers, and they'd been on team truck driving for years. Their names was Charlie and Leroy, and finally they decided they wanted to go to work for another company after they'd been with the same company for a lot of years. So they'd went in together for an interview, and they'd went through a series of different interviews, and and finally they came down to one of the, the final stages in the interview. And so the interviewer looks at Leroy, or looks at Charlie, and he says, Charlie, he said, let me ask you a hypothetical question. And let me see your answer to this. And a lot of this depends on whether we hire you or not. So he looks at Charlie and he says, Okay, let's just say you're loaded up with one of our trucks and you're completely full of produce. You're completely full to the limit, maximum of capacity that you can have. And you're in the mountains in Colorado. And as you're driving along the mountains, your brother Leroy, he's asleep in the back. And as he's asleep in the back, you've got the mountain on one side and you're on this narrow two-lane road and you look over the side and you've got a 300-foot drop-off on the other side. So you're coming down this steep mountain in, or steep hill in the mountains and all of a sudden it, you realize as you start to put on the brakes that the brakes are out. 
That your brakes aren't slowing you down. So you pound on them and pound on them and you're not slowing down. It's not stopping you. So you try to use your emergency brake and that doesn't work either. Everything's failed. You've went through all your gears. You've stripped all the gears out trying to slow down and you just completely, you keep picking up speed. You're going 70 miles an hour, 80 miles an hour, 90, 100, 110, 120 miles an hour. And then all of a sudden you look and at the bottom of the hill, you see this two lane road turn to a one lane bridge. And you look up over the horizon and you see a truck coming down the other hill and he's in the exact same problem. And he's going faster and faster and faster and you realize it dawns on you that you're going to hit that bridge at the exact same time as that other 18-wheeler driver. What do you do? Charlie immediately says, well, I'd wake up my brother Leroy. And he says, in a time like that, why would you break up, wake up Leroy for? Why would that be the first time that you, that the first thing that you would do? And he said, well, we've been driving for a lot of years. And he said, Leroy ain't never seen a big old collision that we're fixing to have. <laughs> I would say he was getting ready to experience it, wouldn't you? Getting ready to experience a great big old collision. So let me ask you a question with that being said. When you think of the word collision, when you think of the word collide, what's your first thoughts? What's your first thoughts? Do you think of something minor, like maybe a little fender bender, or maybe when somebody door dings you? You know, several years ago, we were at Branson on vacation, and we went to white water uh, rafting. And I remember when I was getting out of my car, I was paying more attention to my kids than I was where my door was going to land. And my door pounded, it opened up, and it pounded, kind of hit the car right next to me. And I immediately thought, oh, no, we're on vacation. Now I'm going to have to deal with all this. And I looked down, and there wasn't a single scratch, wasn't a mark, wasn't anything on there. And uh, so I didn't feel good about just taking off. So I went ahead and gave one of my business cards with my phone number on there, and I wrote on there what I had did, and I put it on their windshield, and I said, if you see a dent or see something, then call me. I never heard anything, so I assume I didn't leave a mark. So when you think of the word collide or collision, do you think of that? Do you think of a little fender bender, a little door ding that didn't amount to anything? Or when you think of the word collide, collision, do you think more of like these two trucks that the impact that they were fixing to have whenever they run into each other? You know, I looked up the word collision in the dictionary, and this is what the word uh, collision said, means. It says the act of colliding, a coming violently into contact, a crash or a clash. Coming violently together, a clash or a crash. You know, I would say that based on the definition that this would describe collision to be a little bit more than a fender bender or a little bit more than a door ding, wouldn't you? So how does Light Point Church, how do we uh, describe the word collide? How do we describe the word collision? Well, we defined it this way. We defined uh, our, our prayers is this. Our de definition, and we have it on the website, colliding with God means having an encounter with Him that leaves us dramatically changed. Dramatically changed. Much like how an atom dramatically changed when it collides with another atom, releasing its immense power. Our great hope is that such a collision would leave a person in a decision, lead a person to a decision of faith in Jesus as Lord and Savior of their life and experience real life that God has for them. The vision of Life Point is based on John 10.10, 10, where Jesus says, The thief comes to kill, steal, and destroy, but I have come to give you life and to give it to the fullest. You know, the message says real life. I like the way it says real life. That Jesus come to give us real life. And we wholeheartedly believe that the best possible life that we can live on earth and into eternity is a life that's completely surrendered to Jesus and that any other scenario reduces the satisfaction of the life that God has given us. That's what we believe it means to collide with God. Guys, I tell you this over and over and over and again. And some of you guys that's been here, you probably say, is he preaching on this again? Is he going to say this again? Absolutely yes, because I want you to get it. Guys, we do not want you to have a fender bender or a door ding experience with God on Sunday mornings. We want you to totally collide with God. We want you to collide with God in a way that He's going to impact your life, that something's going to change, that your life, you're going to walk out of these doors completely different than it was when you came in these doors. See, some of you today, I believe, and I'm not looking at anybody, I'm just looking. <laughs> just looking. I think some of you are like Leroy. I think you're in the back of sleep. I think you're going through the motions. And I'm telling you, wake up! Wake up! Because I tell you, God's fixing to do something in your life. He wants to collide with you. He wants to totally transform your life. He doesn't want you to leave the same way that you did when you walked in these doors. Amen? 
So do you believe that today? Do you believe that today? You know, some of you, you walk in here, and it's another thing we check off our list of things to do. Don't let that be. You know, come in here expecting to encounter God and to collide with Him spiritually because I believe the impact that God has on your life, He'll transform you, and not just today, but for all eternity. See, guys, my job as a pastor is to preach truth. It's to preach truth and for that truth to fall on your ears, to fall in your heart, and that truth would get inside and change you from the inside out. I am not simply a cheerleader up here. I'm not trying to give you an emotional goosebump where you walk out and say, oh, pastor, that was the best message that I've ever heard. I don't want that. Do you want to know how to make me excited? Walk it out. Let God collide with you and change your life. You don't have to tell me anything about the message. When it's evident because of your passion in Jesus Christ, that's what I get excited about. I don't want you to walk out and be like on this high. And then all of a sudden, the first thing that hits you and slaps you off the cliff, then you fall down and, man, I'm back in the gutter again. See, God wants to get a hold of you, and He wants to change you. And that's what we've been talking about over these last few weeks. We've been looking at our mission and vision of the church. And now we're in part three of our sermon series called Colliding with God. You know, for the last few weeks, we've been looking at people's life in the Bible that experienced God. That experienced God in a real transformation way. In a real way that they totally changed their life. Not people that just touched base with God and had a little high five or a nux with Him. But they had an experience with God that changed their life forever. They collided with God spiritually and the impact Jesus had on their life transformed them forever. And that's where real life begins. You know what's interesting to me of all the people that we've examined? What's interesting to me is each person that we've examined thus far, and will continue to, they all had different experiences they were going through in life. None of their experiences was the same. They all had different situations they found themselves in. They were all going through different circumstances. However, God's plan and purpose was the same for every single one of them. Even though their situations were different, God's plan and purpose was the same. His plan was to use their situation to get their attention and turn towards Him. Amen. His plan was to use their situation, their circumstances, to get them to turn around and look to Him. So even though their situations was different, it was still the same. He had the same plan, same purpose, to use that to turn around. Just think about the different situations. I'm going to quickly go through these real quick. Saul of Tarsus. Saul of Tarsus, our first week, he was a religious man, and he had a void in his heart. He had a void in his heart that no amount of religious rules could ever fill. They couldn't fill, and he hated Christianity. He hated everything about Christianity, and in fact, he set out to do everything he could to destroy it. But yet he encounters Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus, the risen Lord and Savior on the road to Damascus. And that collide, collision with God changed his life. It changed his life forever, and he ended up becoming known as the Apostle Paul and wrote a third of the New Testament and later on ended up dying for his faith. See, that kind of faith doesn't just happen if you do a little high five with God on Sunday mornings. See, it collided with God and it changed his life. And then the next week, we looked at another situation, but the same answer. Zacchaeus, he was a wealthy man. He was a tax collector. He made a living off of cheating his fellow Jews. And he'd, he'd, even, uh, he'd made a lot of money, but even though he had a lot of money, he still had a longing. He still had a void in his heart that no amount of money could ever fill. He couldn't buy happiness, Amen. So when he heard Jesus was coming to town, he climbed up in a sycamore tree, he collided with God, and he came back down completely different. God changed his life, and he filled the void that no amount of money could ever fill. And then last week, we looked at the Samaritan woman at the well. You know what? She too had a void in her heart. She had a void in her heart that she couldn't seem to fill. And she didn't have a problem with religion or money, but she had a problem with relationships, didn't she? And one relationship to the other, it ended up leading to disappointments, after disappointments, one divorce after another, until she finally felt like she was an outcast. And she went to the well alone, <laughs> and she collided with Jesus. She collided with Jesus, and he brought down all the barriers, and he let her know that all lives matter. And when he got a hold of her life, she went back to town, and she shared her testimony, and several people in the town got saved, and they all come following her back, and they wanted J Jesus to stay with them for two days. And several people in the town got saved because of this one woman that felt like an outcast... The Bible doesn't even name her name. But yet her testimony changed a village. Isn't that awesome how God does it? 
See, God takes different situations, but He's got the same purpose. He's got the same purpose. Guys, each one of these situations were different, but the answer to every single one of them was all the same. The answer was and always will be Jesus. I have several counseling appointments throughout the week, months, or whatever. And do you know when people come in, no matter what they're going through, the answer is always the same. I'm not trying to oversimplify it. Yes, there's details we got to work out and, and different situations. But when somebody comes in with marital problems, you know where I point them to? Jesus. When they come in with financial problems, it's Jesus. When they come in with no purpose, it's Jesus. When they come in with family problems, it's Jesus. When they come in with whatever, addiction problems, it's Jesus, it's Jesus, it's Jesus. The, always the answer is Jesus. D.L. Moody, one of the great preachers of the 1600s, they was asked one time, D.L., how come every single one of your messages sound the same? And he said, well, I just jump in the Bible any old place and I make a beeline right for the cross. The answer is always the same. It's always going to be Jesus. So no matter what these different situations that these people are going through, the answer was still Jesus. See, God simply uses our circumstances that we are in to get us to believe that He is the only answer. God simply uses the circumstances we are in to get us to see Him as the only answer. And that's our story this week. And it was no different than the weeks before. So open up your Bibles to John 4, 46 through 54. And know as we entered this part, this is on the shirt tails of last week. Jesus just left Samaria. He just got done hanging out in Samaria for a couple days. And now he's heading out. Him and his disciples, they pack up and they head for Galilee. And as he's entering Galilee, we're introduced to the next person that collides with God. But see, his situation was different again. It was different from the other three that we experienced. It was different from empty religion or greed or meaningless relationships. This man's situation was different. You know what was wrong with him? He was in the middle of a major crisis. You ever been in the middle of a major crisis before? Anyone? Yeah. I have, haven't you? Y'all been in the middle of some major trouble, some major crisis? This is the situation that this man found himself in. And the truth that I want us to see here is just like the other situation, Jesus had a plan. He had a plan and a purpose even in the midst of a crisis. And this, person, this purpose was to move this man step by step to a life-saving faith. Step by step to a life-saving faith and a faith that would impact him and his entire household for all eternity. So let's look at the steps that led this man from a crisis faith to a life-saving faith and how Jesus could do the same for us. In your outline, first of all, you need to, number one, cry out in your troubles. You need to cry out in your troubles. And that's exactly what we see this guy doing here in our scriptures. So follow along with me as I read verses 46 through 49. It says, Once more, he, being Jesus, visited Cana in Galilee, where he had turned water into wine. And there was a certain royal official whose son lay sick in Capernaum. When the man heard that Jesus had arrived in Galilee from Judea, he went and to him and begged him to come and heal his son, who was close to death. Unless you people see signs and wonders, Jesus told them, you will never believe. And the royal official said, Sir, come down before my child dies. Come down before my child dies. So we see here in this situation that God uses a major crisis in this man's life to begin the steps to saving faith. He uses a major crisis in this man's life to begin the process to a saving faith. Do you know how many times... I've sat down with people and I say, hey, how things going? And they say, oh, good. Couldn't be better. And it's people that might not even be in church. Couldn't be better. I'm living the dream. Life's good. My family's good. Work's good. Money's good. Everything's good right now. I can't think of anything I need. And unfortunately, this includes God. Because things are so good, I don't even need God. See, I see that happening all the time. People come to God sometimes when things are hard, but when things are easy and things are going good, it's easy for us to get our mind off things. So as long as things are going good, it's hard for you to get your mind that you need God. You know, I was talking to somebody the other day, the other night, and we were talking about how much different is the majority of Christianity in America than it is in one of these third world countries that maybe are persecuted because of their faith. And as I sat there thinking about that, do you know how come Christianity looks different in a country that's going through persecution for their faith than what we have it here? It's because everything's good here. We don't need anything. 
We live in a microwave society. We live in a place that everything's at your fingertips. If I want a new job, I simply go get it. If I want a new car, I can get it. If I'm tired of the house I live in, I just sell it and I can go get it. If I want to do this, I can do it. If I want this, want that, even if you can't afford it, that's okay. We can get it on credit, right? Because we live in a society where we have everything we need. So we don't need God. We don't need God. We don't need God any more than just having God in his own little box. We have our job, our hobbies, our families, and we've got God in a box. And every once in a while when we need something else, we take God out of that box and we say, God, hey, we need this, and we need this over here. So it makes our Christianity very shallow, very shallow. However, you take Christianity in a culture where there's persecution, in a culture where they cannot speak the name of Jesus or they die, do you know what happens? Christianity spreads. It spreads like wildfire. You know why? Because they go underground and they're sharing the gospel and they have nothing in life. The only thing that they have to hold on to is God. If God doesn't give me breath, if he doesn't help me, if he doesn't give me food, if he doesn't do this, I depend on him for absolutely everything. See, we don't depend on God like that. God doesn't become the air that we breathe. He doesn't become our dependency. He doesn't become what we lean on because we've got it easy. We've got it easy. Now listen to me and hear me well. I'm not suggesting that I want to live in any other country than America. I think the United States of America is the greatest country of all time. But I do believe this. I do believe that our greatest blessing, which is freedom, is also our biggest curse, and it's our biggest obstacle to overcome. Because we have the freedom to do whatever it is that we want. And because of that freedom, we abuse it. So when everything's good, I've seen people where I just don't need God because everything's good. And over and over, I've seen this. People go through life doing their own thing, and all of a sudden, tragedy hits. Right? Tragedy hits. It strikes out of nowhere. All of a sudden, their careers are disrupted because of an unforeseen layoff. Their children fall into the wrong crowd. Suddenly, changes their relationship with them. Someone you love becomes diagnosed with cancer. Somebody dies, or any number of things happen that gets our attention. And it drives us to a place. It drives us to a place where the only thing that we know to do is to look to God. That's the only thing that we know to do is to look to God for some kind of help. That right there is what was going on in this royal official's life. That's what was going on in his life. You know, some translations call him a nobleman, and maybe that's the way yours worded. But either word, it's the Greek word that means one who serves. One who serves. So with this terminology, it would, it, it would indicate that this man was an official in the government. So if that's the case, this guy's life probably looked pretty good. It probably looked pretty good. He probably had it all together. You know, there's no doubt he was rich. He was very powerful. He was very influential. He was in the upper crowd of society. And he, other men would have feared him. They would have feared him. They would have respected him. He would have been the one calling the shots. He would have been the one directing orders and guiding and calling the shots because he had a huge amount of authority. He answered only to the king, and the king answered to Caesar. If he wanted something, it was done for him. If he wanted something, it was done just like that. If he had a request, all he had to do was say it, and it was done. People came to him to solve their problems. People came to him to solve their problems. Life was good. But now all of a sudden, he finds, him to be, he finds himself to be in the situation with the problem. Now it's kind of reversed. Now he's the one with a problem. His son's sick. His son's sick. How many of you have got children? How many of you enjoy the process of your children being sick? It's hard for a parent, isn't it? Well, this child wasn't just sick a little bit. He was sick a whole bunch. And in fact, the Bible says he was to the point of dying. He was to the point of dying. And I can't even imagine, you know, the Bible doesn't say, but I can just sit there and my mind can just race in thoughts. You know, the fever must have not been able to go down, not be able to get it down. They would probably tried to call on doctors. I mean, he's an official, right? So he's got access to all that stuff. But nothing the doctors did could ever find a cure. And this kid lie there. And at night, your kid calls out daddy. With tears in its eyes, and you can't do nothing about it. You can't fix him. You can't change him. You can't do absolutely anything. You know, I've shared this story before, but I'm going to share it again because it's the closest that I could ever come to I can maybe wrap my brain around what this guy might have been experiencing. Several years ago, when my 16-year-old daughter Gracie was only a baby, she was extremely sick. 
And we, she was dehydrated. We couldn't keep fluids down her. Nothing that we were trying was fixing her. So Rhonda and I finally got nervous, and we went ahead and took the steps, and we went to Liberty, to the emergency room. And when we took her in the hospital, and they were checking her and checking all of her symptoms and everything, they came to the conclusion that a lot of her symptoms looked like she had spinal meningitis. And so when we heard those words, man, we were overwhelmed. We were overwhelmed, and as she laid down on that bed, they kind of wrapped her up in a ball in a fetal position, and they took this really long needle. And as they poked it in her back and into her spine to draw the fluid off there so they could check that, one little tear just streamed down her face. And I remember as a dad, just looking at her, and I felt so helpless. I felt so overwhelmed because there wasn't a single thing that I could do for her. Not a single thing. That's where this guy found himself to be. He was in a situation where his power, his authority, and his wealth didn't mean anything. Didn't mean anything in this situation. He was at a point in his life where it was all stripped away, and he was nothing more than just a dad, just like I was, sitting there looking at his son, completely hopeless, helpless, and overwhelmed in this situation with nowhere to turn except for Jesus. Guys, I'm not saying who causes the catastrophes in our life. I'm not going to stand up here and give you a theological statement and say when we go through tough times, that's God doing it, punishing you, or doing this, or that's the devil doing it. I have no idea where all the crises come from. It's above my pay grade, and can I tell you it's above yours too? We have no idea who does it and who doesn't do it and where it comes from, and what it's for. But I do know this, I do know this, that nothing goes through God's hands without allowing it. There's not a single thing that God lets by without Him knowing it. Nothing takes God off guard. Do you believe God's God? See, I believe that. And I believe that nothing catches Him off guard. And the truth is, some things are going to happen on this side of eternity, and we're just not going to have the answers for we're just not. And I think, frankly, as a Christian, when we get to the other side of eternity, I don't know that them answers are even going to matter anymore. Because I think we're going to have other things on our mind, don't you? My point is this, is unfortunately, sometimes it takes us hitting a crisis before we take the first step and cry out to God. Sometimes we have to hit a crisis in our life before we take the first step and cry out to God. I mean, think about it for just a minute. This guy had it all. He had all the money, the power, and the authority. I'm not sure he would have ever cried out to Jesus had his son not got sick. My opinion. Because it took his son getting sick before he did that. But after his son got sick, he was willing to do whatever because desperate people take desperate steps and desperate times call for desperate measures. He was willing to do whatever it took, even if it meant going on a little hike. You know, see, by this time... The reputation of Jesus was well known. It was well known and it had spread throughout Galilee and, and spread throughout the, the, the community. You know, he had turned water into wine. He had healed many people. He had gained quite the following of people trying to come and, uh, and see if he would heal them of their sickness. So naturally, when this high-powered decision-making official hears that Jesus is coming to Cana, Naturally, 47 says that he immediately put a plan into action. And that plan did not include taking a chance by sending his servants. He didn't say, hey, go take care of this. Go bring Jesus back. See, I think it's because he was scared to death. What if he doesn't come back for them? So I'm going to take a step of faith, and I'm going to go out so I can make sure that he comes back. I wasn't will He's not willing to take that risk. So first of all, he takes a step of faith that included leaving his son, not knowing what was going to happen when he was gone. But if for some chance, if by some chance this guy that they call Jesus can actually heal my son, then I'm going to take a chance, and I'm going to go back and get him. So this royal official leaves Capernaum, and he journeys about 22 miles of dusty roads through hills, through the hills of Cana. You know, he doesn't jump in an SUV and run there in 15, 20 minutes. He takes off on a long journey through the hills on a dusty road on a 22-mile journey so he can humble himself and cry out to Jesus and beg him to come back to Capernaum and heal his son. Verse 47 says, When the official finally reached Jesus, he went to him and he begged him to come and to heal his son so, uh, who was close to death. The word begged here does not mean that he just asked. The word beg actually means he begged repeatedly. He begged repeatedly. He didn't just say, Hey, Jesus, would you come back? He begged with him repeatedly, and, I, and, um, and we see this displayed in his persistency revealed in verses 48 through 49. Unless you people see a sign and wonders, Jesus told them, you will never believe. And the royal official said again, 
Sir, come down before my child dies. So I can just picture here this high-powered official. This high-powered official that's used to having everything calling the shots. He's knowing, not really knowing completely who Jesus is, but he's heard enough rumors that he's willing to take that step of faith. And he comes down and he takes that first step of life-saving faith. And he comes and he quits hiding behind his position of authority. He tracks Jesus down and he falls down to his knees and he cries out with tears, streaming down his face and begins to beg. Begins to beg for Jesus to come back to Capernaum and heal his son. Listen, guys, some of the best prayers are born out of desperation. Some of the best prayers are born out of desperation. You know, if you're here today and can say in some way that you identify yourself with this man, you know, maybe you're here today and you've heard of this Jesus, but you haven't really experienced Jesus one-on-one. -on -one. You've, you've heard of him, your friends have told you about him, your family's told him about him, but you still have not known about him and you're here today and you're in a desperate situation. Maybe your marriage is heading for divorce, maybe your career is in jeopardy, or maybe someone you love uh, is not good concerning their health or whatever it is. I want you to know that God can use this crisis... He can use this crisis that you're going through to turn you around and to put you on solid ground. Take the first step to life-saving faith and cry out to Jesus in your troubles. And then the second step, we need to, number two, trust in His Word. Trust in His Word. You know, we learn in this Scripture that Jesus' plans don't always line up with our plans. We're figuring that out, aren't we? His plans are usually a little different than ours. You know, this plan, this man's plan... He had a plan, and his plan was not to come back alone. The Scripture said that he was going because he wanted to bring Jesus back. He had every intention of making that journey back with Jesus. But Jesus says in verse four, uh, 50, he says, go. He says, go, your son will live. And the man took Jesus at his word, and he departed. Listen, guys, this was a step of faith. This was a step of faith because he didn't even know completely who Jesus was. And Jesus had a plan. Uh, Jesus' plan was different than his plan. And I'm sure that this was probably a little hard to swallow for a man of authority. He tells him to come, and Jesus said go. This official now has a choice to make, doesn't he? He has a choice to make. You know, Jesus just got done telling him in his conversation. He says, you know what? These Galileans, they lack the faith. And he basically got on to them through his discussion. He said, you know what? Unless you guys... See a sign or a miracle, then you won't believe. He kind of got on to him through that. And then he looks at this guy in the conversation as he's talking to him, and he kind of forces him to make a decision. What's he going to do? He can either, number one, he could stay. He could doubt. He could argue with God, right? He could say, no, I need you to come back. I need you to come back. I won't go unless you show me a sign. Show me something that's evident. You don't understand. I took a 22-mile journey to get here. I ain't going back based on that, what you just said. I want something a little bit more. See, that's what the Galileans were looking for, a sign. But all he said was go. So all he said, so the second choice that he had was to actually take a step of faith and believe in his word without a sign. Well, he chose number two. He took Jesus at his word and he departed. Can I tell you, that's a beautiful picture of simple faith. Just taking God at his word. This man didn't have faith in the sign that he saw. He, he, his step of faith was in the truth of the word that he was spoken. You know, some of you are here today with your eyes fixed on a miracle. You're fixed on a miracle. You're here today, and you've kind of made a little deal with God. I don't even know if I believe in you, but you know what? I'm talking to you, and if you fix this or that, then I'll believe in you. If you fix this or that, I'll believe in you. If you do this or that, then I'll believe in you. If you change this or that, then I'll believe in you. If you deliver me from this or that, then I'll believe in you. If you heal me from this and that, then I'll believe in you. Guys, if that's your thought today, then can I tell you, I'm not guaranteeing you that God won't work for you because God's God and I'm not, and He might just do it just to show you. But can I tell you, oftentimes God works His best when we take the step of faith not knowing in what the outcome's going to be. Sometimes we have to step before we see God work. It wouldn't be faith if we knew the answers, right? It wouldn't be faith if we understood everything. It requires taking that step of faith. This, uh, this official dude had to take that first step. He had to trust God at his word and take that step. Can I tell you why God operates like that? Why I believe? I believe it's because he wants us to fix our eyes on the blesser and not the blessing. See, if we fix our eyes on the miracle or the sign or the blessing, then all we want is this, this, this. God kind of becomes our genie in a bottle. And we want this. And if God gives us this, then we will give him that. Guys, that's not Christianity. That's not what it's all about. 
God doesn't want you to be in love with the blessing. He wants you to be in love with the blesser. And when you're in love with the blesser, if your blessing doesn't look like the way your plans look like, then you're still okay because I'm secure in the blesser. But if we're just after the blessing and we don't get it, then we walk away and our hearts get hard and we get calloused. And we say, I tried to believe in that God thing and it didn't work. Isn't that the way it happens? See, this official, he took the first step. He took the first step. Guys, we need to allow our crisis to drive us to our knees and begin trusting him in his unfailing word without demanding a miracle, just step and trust. Our story today, the steps of faith include, to saving faith include crying out to God in your troubles, trusting in his word, and number three, surrender all and never look back. Surrender all and never look back. You know, at this point in our story, we arrive at the final steps of faith, of saving faith, that led to the greatest impact in this man's life. Follow along in verses 51 and 54 as we tie this up. It says, while he was still on his way, meaning the servant or the official, while he was still on his way, his servants met him with the news that his boy was living. And when he inquired as to the time when his son got better, they said to him yesterday at one in the afternoon, the fever had left him. And then the father realized that this was the exact time at which Jesus said to him, your son will live. So he and his whole household believed, and this was the second sign that Jesus performed after coming from Judea to Galilee. Now I want you to put yourself in this guy's shoes for just a moment, okay? So here he is. His son's falling apart. He's sick. He can't do nothing about it. He takes his 22-mile journey so he can reach Jesus because he wants to bring Jesus back. And Jesus says, no, I'm not going back with you. You just go. So now he's taking this step of faith. He's, he's going through this. And this is a day, remember, it was before bag phones. They hadn't come out yet. This was 2,000 years ago. So there wasn't a way that they could text him. There wasn't a way that he could just get on the phone and say, hey, Jesus said that my son's healed. Is he okay? No, he had to take this 22-mile journey, one step after another, wondering and wondering what's going on. Now, the Bible doesn't say this, but based on my 44 years of experience with the human mind, there's no doubt that as he's walking, many thoughts are going through his brain. Don't you think? I think with every step, he's wrestling around with the idea. He's probably sitting here thinking, okay, I know what Jesus said. I know he said he's healed. I know he said he's doing that. And I'm stepping in obedience. And I'm believing. I'm believing in him. I'm believing in his words. But then on the other hand, gosh, I know how sick my son was. And what if I get back? And what if it's not fixed? What if it's not right? What if I've wasted this trip all the way back? Don't you think some of these thoughts were probably going through his mind? He's probably juggling around trying to figure this. And as he's getting closer, he's sitting here thinking, oh my gosh, you know, what's really happening? Could this really be true? And if so, I wonder how long it's going to be until he recovers. I wonder how long he's going to continue to be sick until he gets up. And as he's going, and as he's each step, he's wrestling with this thought, and these questions are going through his mind. Don't you think that would have been a long 22-mile walk home? And as he's doing this, he looks up on the horizon, and he sees this crowd of people coming over. And he's sitting there looking, and he hears shouting, he hears screaming, and he's sitting there, and he's keeping his eyes on them. He's trying to figure out who they are. He's sitting there looking, and as they get closer, and as they get closer, he hears them, but he can't make out what they're saying. And then finally, he looks at them, and he's got a glimpse enough to know that it's his servants. It's his servants, and they're coming over the hill. They're coming at him, and they're hearing him yell, but he can't understand what they're saying. I'm sure there was probably a lump in his throat wondering... Are they going to tell me the worst news that I could ever hear? Are they going to tell me that my son has passed away? But the closer they get, the closer they get, he starts to hear, he starts to listen. And he realizes the things that they're shouting and the things that they're doing. They're laughing. They're laughing. And they're shouts of joy. And they start yelling and they say, Master, your son lives. He's alive. He's fine. He's not sick anymore. He feels good. Can you imagine that overwhelming feeling that that guy must have felt? I believe as they all came around him, I bet I just kind of picture him falling to his knees and his tears of joy or his tears of sadness have now changed to tears of joy. And he starts sitting there thinking, he starts talking, how did this happen? How did it happen? What time did it happen? Tell me all about it. When did it happen? And they, when did he start getting better? How long did it take him? Oh, master, you don't understand. <laughs> he didn't just start getting better. He just became better. His fever immediately left, and he just became healed. What time did this happen? It happened in the seventh hour is what some translations say. Our NIV translates it to the first hour, to one o'clock. So as he's sitting there, he gets to thinking one, one hour, first hour, second hour, third hour, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh. Oh my gosh, the seventh hour was the exact moment 
that Jesus told me 22 miles away <laughs> that my son was going to be healed. Oh my gosh, hallelujah. Could you imagine the thought that this guy must have felt? See, I believe at that point right there, I believe at that point, that a miracle right there, this man, this man, <laughs> he collided with Jesus. I think the reality of who Jesus was, I think everything come rushing to him, I think he understood everything, and the impact that happened in his life, it moved him from a crisis faith to a faith that surrendered all and never looked back. See, most of us, sometimes we're in that crisis faith, and he wants to move us from that crisis faith to a faith that surrenders all and never looks back. The Bible says that this uh, royal official, he surrendered all so much, he was so fully in that not just him got saved, his whole household got saved whole household. His servants, his family, everything, his whole household got saved. Because see, that's what happens when you collide with God. When you collide with God, it doesn't just impact you. It impacts your household. It impacts your work. It impacts the people around you. Because God's got a hold of you. And I tell you what, you can't stop. You can't shut up. See, that's what happened in this situation. I'm going to ask Carrie to come on up. Carrie went over again. <laughs> When God truly collides with you, it impacts everything. See, there was two miracles that day. There was two miracles that God, day. There was a physical miracle of the healing of the boy's sickness, but then there was also a, a healing that I want you to understand and hear today. There was a spiritual healing. There was a he spiritual healing of this man's heart, the nobleman's heart. So let me ask you, where are you on the steps to faith? Where are you on the steps of faith? Guys, look it up here. Because this is important. Are you here today because you're in the crisis faith mode? Your life's kind of falling apart. You see things kind of going out of control. And for some reason you're here. But you haven't fully all committed. You haven't completely believed in this. You're kind of touching the waters, right? You're kind of seeing if this God thing's real. You're tired of people talking to you. Your mom's talking to you. Your dad talking to you. Your parents, you're, you're tired of your children talking to you. You're tired of the family, your people you work with. All these, all these people are telling you about the great things God's doing in their life. So you're going to just come and you're going to check it out for yourself. See, you're in a crisis faith spot where God's wanting to use this to step you through it. Maybe some of you today are in the second step. Maybe you're here, you're trying to trust in God's word. You're taking that step of obedience, but you just haven't fully committed. You haven't fully committed to God. You haven't fully come to a place where you completely surrendered to God. Can I tell you, if you're in either one of those steps, quit dabbling around. Quit dabbling around and quit just kind of playing the church thing. God wants to impact your life. He wants to grab you from the inside out and change everything about you. He wants you to collide with Him. Quit dabbling around. He wants you to be all in. He wants you to surrender all and never look back. What does that look like? What does that look like? You know, the best thing that I could think of when I was thinking of this, of different things that I went through in my life, and here several years ago, Rhonda and I, we went to the Lake of the Ozarks with John and Melanie Martin for the weekend, for a long week, and we kind of had fun and took their parents' uh, pontoon boat out. While we were out tooling around, there was this cliff. And I looked at that cliff and I said, I want to jump off that cliff. So I did. I got out of the boat, I swam over, I climbed up, and I jumped. And you know, I show you that picture for two reasons. The first reason is because it really looks cool, doesn't it? <laughs> but the second reason, and actually more important, is that's the steps of faith that we have in our life. That's the steps that we went over today. I had to get out of that boat before I could jump, didn't I? I had to get out of the boat, I had to swim over, I had to climb up the cliff, and I had to jump. Guys, can I tell you, when I was in midair right there, there was no going back. There was no going back. I mean, it was surrendering all. It was all in. It was all in. Based on faith, I had no idea what that was going to look like and what the outcome was going to look like. You can get the picture off there now. But listen, here's my point. Here's my point. Is I think some of you right now are in the stinking boat. You're in the boat, and I'm telling you, get out of it. Quit sitting around on the back row. Quit slipping in here, just dabbling around. Get out of the boat. Take the steps of faith. Get up that cliff, and then just quit standing up here on this cliff, scared to death, because if I get off here, then God might call me to do something different. God might require me to give up a habit. 
God might require to move me back and forth to Texas in a year. God might require taking me to Haiti. God might require me going and telling my neighbor. God might require me fixing my family and my, my, my relationship with my spouse. But see, I tell you what, as long as you're on the cliff holding on, <laughs> you're not going to experience the impact of letting go. You know, when I got down to the boat, my wife said, you're an idiot. <laughs> she said, that was so crazy. Why did you do that? And why did you jump in head first? You have no idea what was in that water. And I said, I know, but it was awesome. <laughs> I knew I had to jump if I was going to experience the greatest impact. Several of you guys, the reason why your life is such a mess is because you're still holding on to the cliff. You're still holding on. Surrender all, jump, and don't look back. Don't look back. 16 years ago, I made a spiritual jump, and I dove head into this God stuff. You know what? I decided when I jumped, I wasn't looking back. I didn't want the good old life that I used to have because it wasn't really that good. I didn't want the alcohol. I didn't want the arguing and the fighting that we constantly have. I jumped spiritually and I never looked back. See, when you jump spiritually and never look back, I'm telling you, that's where the greatest impact comes in in your life. That's where the greatest impact in your household comes, your family, your community. Would you just jump? Quit holding on. He wants to take you step by step to get you there. Amen. I'm going to have you stand at your feet as we close today. Bow your head for just a moment. And let me ask you, where are you at in the faith process? Are you still in the boat? Are you up on the cliff? Or have you jumped yet? If you haven't and you want to today, would you just raise up your hand and say, Pastor, that's me. I want to be all in. I want to surrender everything to him and I don't want to look back. Would you just raise your hand? Anyone? Raise up your hand. I see you back there. Anyone else? Raise up your hand. I see you there. I see hands going up here. Anyone else? Let's say this prayer together. Say, Dear God, I love you. I believe in your son, Jesus. I believe he died on the cross for my sins. I ask you to forgive me. I want to jump head first into everything you have for me. And I never want to look back. I want to leave the old life behind and live my life to the fullest. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.